If you look online for nutrient deficiencies, you will find this chart or similar charts wherever you go. Some of these charts are actually for terrestrial plants rather than aquatic plants. If you look closely, you will see that these deficiencies can also be found on aquarium plants. However, this chart won't tell you the entire picture. That being said, there's nothing wrong with using a chart like this as a quick reference. This is something even I do. But hear me out. What if I told you that using this chart can actually lead you to worse plant health and possibly more algae growth? There are going to be a few instances where you can fix the general issue by simply addressing one of these nutrient deficiencies. That might not always be the case. You may already be meeting the requirements for all of your plant nutrition needs, but they still might be showing nutrient deficiencies. This might make you think that you aren't adding enough fertilizer, so you keep increasing it to the point where you might as well just dump the entire bottle into the tank every week. This is exactly what happened in my 12 gallon tank. It may look fine as it is, but if you look closely you will start to see imperfections. Logically, I increased the dosage of my fertilizer. This didn't do anything. So why? The answer obviously does not deal with fertilizers, but rather one of these two variables. Light, CO2, and nutrients are all interconnected. If one of them is lacking, your plants will be unhappy, but algae will. So, unless you're deliberately growing algae for some reason, you need to consider these three all together. Plants won't care how many nutrients you give them if they aren't able to use them in the first place. For example, photosynthesis is heavily reliant on a catalyst. Light. Without light, they can't utilize any nutrients and CO2. Think of this like a vehicle. A car can't move without fuel, or in our case, that would be nutrients. Even with the fuel, you can't move if you can't start the ignition with a key. In our case, the light is the key. Even with the other two, we still can't move if we don't have a gas pedal, which would be CO2. In a sense, it always comes down to tank balance. For my tank, I did a couple of things. I changed my fertilizer to the EI method, a much heavier fertilizing method. I also increased the light intensity. You would think to decrease it since I was getting algae, but nope. I increased it because I started to see legginess in my stem plants. Legginess is a common sign of low light intensity. And as for CO2, I kept it the same as the drop checker was already green. This is all and dandy, but there is one very important aspect to all of this that you need to remember. You would look at this graph, jot down the fixes, and then apply the fixes all at once. It makes sense to do this as you probably want to get all of the plants up to speed so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Except this might be a bad idea. Let me explain. If I were to apply both my nutrients and lighting changes at the same time, and it ends up working, how do I know exactly which one resolved which issue? You might not care since you solved it, but what happens if you encounter this issue again? Furthermore, there are some issues where there's a crossover. For example, staghorn algae can either be caused by fluctuating CO2 levels, nutrient deficiencies, or weak flow. If you address all of these issues at the same time, how do you know which one solved it? The only way to know is to change a single variable one at a time. This way, you can create your own knowledge base of how plants and algae respond to a specific change. When making changes like this, it will take time as plants will need to adjust to the new environment. It usually takes around two weeks for plants to physically adjust. Of course, the faster a plant grows, the quicker it will adjust. Some can take one week, while others could take up to like three weeks. Balancing a tank and healthy plant growth is not a race, nor should it be taken as one. If you change something but only wait a few days, you might not see any changes and might second guess if what you did had any effect. You will also need to pay attention to the health of new growth, rather than looking at leaves that are covered in algae or damaged. Which leads me to the next topic, maintenance. I know that some people don't like maintenance, but I believe it's a necessity for majority of tanks. If your plants are recovering from algae or any nutrient deficiencies, the damage has already been done. There is nothing you nor the plant can do to fully repair it. The same can be said for algae covered leaves. If the algae is dead, some dead algae can still be anchored to the leaf. The only way around this is to trim the infected leaves. And yes, you should remove them when you see them damaged. This will make the plant redirect the energy for 
for upkeeping damaged leaves into making new healthy ones. As long as the stem and roots are healthy, you can still trim the majority of infected leaves and they will still grow. That being said, if the entire plant is covered in deficiencies, it might be best just to wait a little bit for the plant to grow longer with healthy growth. Then you can trim the healthy section, uproot the infected plants, and replace it with the healthy trimmings. Now, there is also one more thing that can cause plants to not get the nutrients they need as this issue revolves around the roots. There is a common thought where detritus is a good thing as it can provide nutrients to plants. While this is undeniably true, just like everything, there will always be too much of a good thing. If you have too much detritus built up, it can physically interfere with root expansion and block oxygen from diffusing into the soil, thus leading to anaerobic conditions. These conditions can essentially choke out plant roots, which makes it difficult for them to uptake nutrients. Furthermore, detritus is quite light and it can get virtually anywhere. This means that it can fit into small pockets in the substrate where it can cause structural disruption and cause the substrate to be less compact. This makes the substrate feel lighter and can cause plants to uproot themselves. Plus, it's incredibly harder to plant in, especially when using aqua soil. So how much detritus is too much? Well, the critical point is where you start to see it form on the substrate. The same can be said in situations where it's difficult to plant in certain areas or they're easily getting uprooted. Furthermore, if you start to see cyanobacteria growth in your substrate, this is a a clear indication of anaerobic activity in that area and is a spot you need to focus on. That being said, if you want to learn more about the importance of substrate cleaning and how to do it, check this out.